Okay. Loving Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for once again another privilege. It's truly a privilege. But we still have the freedom to study your word. Please, Lord, we are humbly requesting the guidance of your spirit. We are asking, Lord, that our hearts and minds now would be in a receptive place to receive your word. Please may you encourage our hearts concerning your remnant church. Help us to see from your word that indeed heaven has, God has ordained a church in these last days to be his representative who is separate from the world, separate from Babylon, and who has a special message to bear to a dying world. Father, please bless us now as we look at Revelations 12. Please may yeah, you just encourage our hearts, strengthen our hearts in this truth that when the crisis breaks, Lord, we would not be a part of those who abandoned the remnant church and become a part of Babylon. Please may you bless us now and teach us, for we ask these things humbly, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so what are we going to do today? This one will be a short one. We're going to look at Revelations 12. We have looked at it before, at least some parts of it we have looked at. So it's not going to be the entire chapter. So come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Now, our previous study, we studied Babylon. That's what we studied in our previous study. God says, come out of Babylon. So someone might say, okay, come out of Babylon and go where? Go where? We saw that Babylon represents the fallen denominational churches. So the message of the second angel, is, which is a part, and fourth angel, says, come out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. So someone might say, where do I go to? From, from there, where do I go to? Do I try and revive Babylon? No, Babylon cannot be revived. Babylon cannot be revived. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. There is no revival in Babylon. God says you come out of Babylon. Now, there were men who tried and revived Babylon, but they realized it was impossible. Because Martin Luther tried, and he realized it's impossible, he must separate. Wycliffe tried, he saw it's impossible, he must separate. Many reformers, John Haas tried and he saw, I must separate. However, all those churches in which those men separated from, and those churches were the daughters, if they were in one time, they were true and loyal to God, but when the founders died, those churches would not go, would not go further than what their founders saw. They, they put their, their banner, so to speak, where, they, where they, uh, their founder stopped, where he stopped in the light. They put their banner, they said, that's for I know further. God could not continue with them. He had to raise up a new movement, and he constantly raised up new movements throughout the time. Eventually, he raised up his final movement. Now, we want to identify who is this final people, who are they? Does God have a church upon planet Earth? So, what we're going to look at is Revelations 12. And I believe Revelations 12 has the history of the church, the entire history of the church, from before Christ came, his Old Testament church, into the New Testament church, into the dark ages when his church was persecuted during that time, eventually into the remnant church, that final group of people that will be upon planet Earth just before Jesus Christ comes. So we're going to look at Revelation 12 to identify God's remnant church. Who is God's remnant church? Now, let me say this, even if we never studied Revelation 12, even if we never look at it, from what we have already previously studied, God's church can be identified. So what do I mean? All we need to do is look for a church that teaches the first, the second, and the third angel's message. Because that is God's true church. After the proclamation of those messages, God, Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. So who, let me ask you this. That church that proclaims the first, the second, and the third angel's message, would it be the beginning of earth history? I'm saying would it be his first church? Or would it be his final last day remnant church who proclaims the three angels' messages? Wh which church do you think could it be? His first church that he establishes or his last final church is remnant church just before Jesus Christ mm -hmm. comes? The remnant. How do we know that? Because after those messages are proclaimed, we see Jesus Christ coming on the clouds of heaven. That means this is the final church, the final message. So all I need to do is if I'm going to find God's remnant church, I need to look for a global church. 
It cannot be a local church just in South Africa or just in the United States or just in wherever in China. No, no, no. It has to be a global. You say, why do I say that? It's because the first angel's message or the three angels' messages go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's Revelation 14 verse 6. So it's a global church. Also, you are looking for a church that proclaims we are living in God's judgment hour. You're looking for a church that teaches health reform, giving glory to God, a church that teaches dress reform, a church that teaches to honor God's law, a church that teaches to keep the Sabbath day holy, a church that exalts God's law. So you are looking for such a church. You're looking for a church that teaches the pure gospel, the everlasting gospel. So those are identification marks of the remnant church or of the church that lives just before the second coming. That's the first angel's message. Just looking at it identifies the true church. But let's continue our study and, and, and look at Revelation 12. So I'm saying just what that's, that's sufficient enough that stands as an anchor that shows God's true church. And what Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 about his true church, he mentions they keep the Sabbath. So you have to be looking for a Sabbath-keeping church, a church that keeps the Sabbath. That's Matthew 24, the church that lives during the Great Tribulation. And even after the Tribulation, Jesus mentions specifically in Matthew 24, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. Why? For then shall be great tribulation such as never was since there was a nation. So Jesus, based on Jesus' words, his final church would be keeping the Sabbath. Any church that rejects the Sabbath, you are looking at Babylon. And I'm going to say... There are churches that keep the Sabbath, but they are still Babylon. Those churches are Babylon as well. There are churches that keep the Sabbath, but they are not God's remnant church. Even though they keep the Sabbath, there's other points of truth that they clearly reject, which is a part of the mother system, Babylon. Some abominations they hold to, which has its roots within Babylon, the mother of all its. So what I want us to do now, let's look at Revelation 12. We're not going to study the whole chapter, but we looked at some parts of this chapter. So let's look at Revelation 12. We're going to start in verse 1. It says in Revelation 12 verse 1, it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Verse 2, I'll come back to verse 1. Verse 2, And she being a child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now let's stop there and then we'll go further. So one of the first, um, I forgot to put the picture now, that, that's what I forgot, to so put the picture of this woman. So this woman is standing, the Bible says that she is standing upon the moon, that this woman is clothed with the sun, and that she has a crown of 12 stars upon her head. And then it says that this woman, that's, that's verse 1. That's the description of the woman. Then verse 2 says that the woman is in travail. She's about to give birth. She's about to give birth. Now, let me ask you this. Based on that description, do you think that this is an apostate woman like Babylon? Or do you think this is a pure woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars? And then it says that she has this child. She's about to give birth to this child. As we're going to keep studying, we're going to see who's the child. Actually, the child is Jesus. We'll see that as we keep looking. So this, through, through this church, Jesus comes through this church. Now, let me ask you this. Is this a harlot woman? I'm saying, when you look at this, is this woman decked with gold and precious stones? Is she wearing purple and scarlet? How is this woman described? What, what, let me ask, is this... This is a pure woman. Based on the description, yeah, this is a pure woman. She's clothed with the sun. With, in other words, the light of the sun, so to speak. Not so much with the sun itself, but that light, the brightness, the light of the sun. She's standing on the moon. Twelve stars around her head. So this is... We're going we're gonna to suggest... This is not Babylon. This is a pure woman. Now, I'm not going to go and show any verses for this. We showed it in our previous study. Can you tell me what is a woman in Bible prophecy? And then I want some verses from you without looking at your notes. What is a woman 
in Bible prophecy. It's a church. Amen. Give I us. Have no idea where in the Bible. Is <laughs> oh, oh, friends, we're gonna be in trouble. <laughs> we're gonna be in trouble. If we can tell people, hey, a woman's a church. Give me verses. Hey, sh- I don't know. <laughs> oh, people are gonna run away. <laughs> can someone give me some verses? <laughs> Second Corinthians eleven two. Amen, amen. That that is a powerful one. Second Corinthians eleven two. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, how do we know that a woman is a church? Anyone? Ah, friends. Um, what about Genesis three? Okay, you could use Genesis three fifteen, but how are you going to prove it? You could read it, but you're going to have to start doing some proving to prove a woman's a church. If you're going to use Genesis 3.15, you want clear text that actually just make it simple for us. Okay, I'm going to just, we can just, let's just bow our heads for a short prayer. Loving Father, we are so thankful that we could come back on the platform. We know Satan is so afraid of these truths, Lord, for these truths are perfectly calculated to prepare us for that great event, the second coming of Jesus. Father, please bless us now as we continue to study your word. Please, when you continue to teach us, to us closer to you. And thank you so much for overruling Satan's de- design to block the studies. Please bless us now, Father, as we continue, for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so let us go back to Revelations um, 12. So I'm not going to ask, but I remember the last thing I was asking in Revelation 12. Um, what was I asking? The scriptures for w- what is a woman. So I think maybe you'll went and you'll review that. So that is fine. So the next thing, we know that it's a church. So now what we want to do is identify specifically the identification marks of this church. Now this is not Babylon. It, can, it is not Babylon. This church is God's true church, which we're going to see as we keep reading. So what we want to do now is look at the identification marks of this true church. Now, it's not all found in verse 1 and 2, but at least some of it is introduced. So there's two things we want to look at, actually three things. What we did discover, we're actually looking at, I don't know if we can see the board. Can we see the board? Brother Kevin, can you you make my screen a bit? um, Okay, That's, that's good. So, let's see, okay. So what are we looking at? We are looking at God's true church. God's true church. So some of the identification marks, number, let's put them down. It mentions that this church is standing on the moon. We identify that a woman is a church. It says that she's clothed with the sun. So she's standing, she's standing on the moon and she's clothed with the sun. So we need to identify what's the moon, what's the sun, and it says she has a crown, a crown of 12 stars. We need to identify what what, what do these 12 stars represent. So number one, let's first identify the moon. So I'm not sure in in your discussion, what was your conclusion concerning the moon? Did you come to a conclusion, what is the moon? Because the church is standing on the moon. God's remnant church stands upon the moon. She is clothed with the sun and she has 12 stars. Can, what was your conclusion concerning the moon? What is this moon that God's true church is standing upon? It's a witness, is what I heard. A witness, okay. So God's church is a witness, a powerful, powerful, powerful. Anything else you'll add besides a witness? The foundation. Found, okay, foundation, what do you mean? When you say foundation, what do you mean foundation? Yes, foundation is the fact that she's standing. Yes, she is. Sta- yes, the moon is the foundation. But what is the moon? A foundation that she's standing on. It. That's the foundation of this church. The church is built. It's standing upon this thing. What is this thing that this church is standing upon? Truth and judgment. Cornerstone, Christ. All powerful stuff. All powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. But I want us to see. Powerful. But let's now go to the Bible. Now, in order to understand the spiritual, let's first go and understand the literal physical moon. I'm saying there's no way, like the fact that God uses moon, sun, stars, there's no way we're going to identify 
the symbolism until we go and see what did God actually create the moon for? What was the purpose of the moon? In order to understand it, its spiritual application, we must first Light. go in, Okay, powerful. But let's go and see. That is true. But specifically, let's see. To rule over the dark. Right. Okay, but right. let's see. Let's see what the, the Bible specifically identifies. What was the purpose of the moon? Come with me to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. I want us to read when God creates the two great lights. Genesis one verse sixteen. Genesis chapter one, verse sixteen. It says in Genesis one verse sixteen, and God. Okay, and God made two great lights, the greater, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So before I continue on the ox, can somebody tell me which is the greater light and which is the lesser light by name? Because it says he made two great um, light by name. The sun, it, the sun, the sun and the, the amen. And the moon lesser. Amen, amen, amen. Let's keep reading now, verse 17. Actually, ish, am I reading the right verse? Let's keep reading. Hmm. Actually, you know what? Let's, let's actually read. Let's go up. Let's go up a bit. Let's go up. 14. Let's start in verse... Hmm. Okay, let's read verse 17. Maybe we, let's read verse 17. Let's read verse 17. Can someone read verse 17 for us? And verse 18. Let's read 17 and, and 18. God, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Amen. Now let's stop, and I want us to now think. Let's think now. God made two great lights. The sun to rule the day, the moon to rule the light. Now let me ask you this. What is the moon? Would you agree with me that the moon is a light that shines in the darkness? Would you agree with me that the moon is a light? Because it says yeah. he made two great lights. One to rule the day and one to rule the night. So the moon is a light based on the Bible, verse 16. He says he made two great lights. And one of the lights is the moon. One was to rule the day and one was to be a light that shines in a dark place. That is the, the moon. So let's write what is the moon. Let's write what is the moon. The moon, based on verse 16, 17, 18. It is a light, but it's a light that rules in the darkness. It is an, a light that shines in the darkness. So let's write a, the moon is a light based on Bible. It's a light that shines in the darkness. That's Bible. So the moon is a light that shines in darkness. Now, my question is, what spiritually is a light that shines in darkness because that is the moon which the church is standing on literally a moon as a light that shines in darkness so let us go and see what sorry oh, amen <laughs> amen let's see coming to second peter chapter 1 verse 19 second peter chapter 1 verse 19 second peter 1 verse 19 it says in second peter chapter 1 Verse 19, it says we have also a more sure, take note, word of prophecy. So before I go any further, what are we specifically speaking about? The word of prophecy. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto unto you do well that you take heed. So I must take heed to the sure word of prophecy. What has God likened the sure word of prophecy to? As unto a light that shineth in, the, in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So based on, on, on 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verses 19. Can you all tell me, before we go to 2 Peter 1, 19, God says the church is standing on the moon. I went to Genesis, and Genesis says that the moon is a light which shines or to rule in the darkness. It's a light that shines in the darkness. Now I'm seeing spiritually there is something that God has given spiritually as a light that shines in a dark place, and that is the sure word of prophecy. The sure word of prophecy. So what am I seeing? When I'm looking for God's final remnant church is true church of Bible prophecy, I'm looking for a church. I'm looking for a church that is standing on the moon. I'm looking for a church that is standing on prophecy. So when you're looking for God's true church, you're looking for a church that stands on prophecy. A church that is strongly emphasized prophecy. Strongly, strongly emphasizes prophecy. Mm -mm. Okay, you can't see my board. It's fine. But, uh, okay. Strongly emphasizes prophecy. That's number one. Now number two, we have to look at the sun. What is the sun in which the church is clothed with? Did you come to any conclusions concerning the sun? Anyone came to conclusions? What was your conclusions? Righteousness. Mm. Okay. Amen. 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 Now, we just saw in Genesis that God created the sun as a light. Now, let's go to the Bible and see. Let's go to the Bible and see what does God liken to a light. Come in your Bible to Psalms 37. What does God liken to a light? Psalms 37. Psalms chapter 37. Psalms 37. Psalms 37. I want us to see Psalms chapter 37. I want us to read Psalms 37 verse 6. Psalms 37 verse 6. Let's see what is God likened to a light. It says, And he shall bring forth, take note, thy righteousness and he shall bring forth that's God he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday so based on the Bible when God refers to righteousness he likens righteousness to a light and this church is clothed with the sun and based on Genesis that the sun is a light it is the great light so when we're looking for God's true church we are looking for a church that specifically emphasizes, righteous, emphasizes righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. Now, I don't think we can see this, this board properly. Let's try and put it forward. So the sun, what we are seeing so far that the church is standing on the moon, the show word of prophecy. The church is clothed with the sun, meaning this church specifically emphasizes or teaches righteousness by faith, the righteousness of Christ. So the show word of prophecy and the righteousness of Christ, this is God's true church. So when you're looking for God's remnant, make sure this church strongly emphasizes righteousness by faith and the show word of prophecy. Another thing that says that the church, this church, has a crown of 12 stars on, 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 on her head. Now, can somebody, I don't know what was your conclusion concerning the 12 stars. Was there any conclusion? What, 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 what was your conclusion? What are these 12 stars symbolic of? Of disciples, 12 gates. Amen. 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 Actually, let's prove that. Let's prove that. Come with me to Genesis. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, the beginning. Come into Genesis chapter 30. Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37. This is Joseph, one of um, Jacob's children, one of the patriarchs. And I want you to see one of the tribes of Israel. I want you to see that jo Joseph is going to actually have a dream. Concerning his, his, his brethren, who are 11 of his brethren, of his father and of his mother. And I want you to see in this dream, what is Jacob's bread, oh sorry, Joseph's brethren likened to in the dream? Because this is a dream about his 11 brothers. Let's see what does he see in the dream. 
which obviously is, his brothers are 11. What does, he, what, what does God liken his brothers to? Genesis 37. I want us to see verse 9. Genesis 37 verse 9. It says, And he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it to his brethren. He told his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, take note what he says, the sun and the moon, and he's speaking about his brothers now. Actually, when you look further, you see the sun represents his, his father, the moon represents his mother. It says, and the 11 stars basically says they worship me. Verse 10, and he told it to his father. Now take note, and his, and his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? dreamed? Shall I, obviously representing himself, the sun representing him, and thy mother representing the moon, and thy brethren, and thy brethren which will represent the stars, indeed come and bow down ourselves to thee to the earth. So you can see in this dream Joseph has, Jacob now interprets the dream. We see the dream in verse 9. But Jacob now gives the interpretation. He understands. He says, shall I, representing the sun, the moon, your mother, and your, your brethren come and bow down before you. So you can see that the star specifically, actually Joseph would be the 12th star. He would be the 12th star. But nonetheless, the stars represent, based on this, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The 12 tribes of the children of Israel. In other words, this church finds its roots in the Old Testament. If you trace its roots, this, this church we are studying, you trace its roots, you're going to trace it right back to the Old Testament. But not only in the Old Testament will you find it. From the Old Testament, you'll see it also represents the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples. Now let's go and see this in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation, the 21st chapter. Revelation 21. Can someone read for me verse 12 and verse 14 of Revelation 21? Verse 12 and verse 14. Revelation 21, verse 12 and verse 14. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Amen. Okay, before you continue, my sister, so here we see that the gates, the city in which the redeemed, every redeemed, every redeemed would walk into, we see that the gates, 12, the, there's 12 gates, and every one of those gates have one of the names of the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay? Every Christian, in order to be saved, you have to be a follower of Christ. So you enter into one of these gates, now jump down to verse, did I say verse 14? Yes, verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Amen. So the foundation of the city in which every Christian who enters into war is going to stay in the city, the foundation of that city is the 12 apostles. So you can see that everyone was redeemed, every redeemed, all of the redeemed, in some, some, some degree, have a connection with the truths God committed to the 12 tribes or that God committed specifically to the 12 apostles. So what are we are saying? We are saying that the 12 stars specifically represent, I'm going to say the old slash and the new Testament church. The Old and the New Testament. So the truths that you find in the Old Testament, you find in the New Testament. This church fully embraces both the Old and the New Testament. Do you know there are churches that either embrace the Old and they reject the New, or they embrace the New and they reject the Old? But God's true church will embrace both because their roots are found in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. So what are we looking for? A church that stands on the foundation of prophecy. A church that is clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So they strongly emphasize prophecy. They strongly emphasize the right, righteousness by faith. A church that believes in the Old and the New Testaments. Their foundation. Their foundation is found in the Old and the New Testament. So this is the description of the church. 
Let's go back now to Revelation 12, the identification marks. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Um, I don't know if th th those are hands up for anything I've said. Are those hands up? Yeah. I okay. have a question real quick. Okay. Is this 12 tribes of Israel is represented by the stars? Then what could we say that those that are on the crown would also represent the sealed in the last days, the 144,000, because there are be 12,000 coming from each tribe? Yes, um, actually, yes. The remnants, actually, when you go to the, when we come to the conclusion, the 144,000 actually, or, or, as the Bible describes them as the remnants. That's the conclusion of the matter. Yeah, the Old and New Testament, then his church, actually, we're going to see his church throughout, 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 throughout. From the beginning, as we are looking now, all the way right through to the time of translation, it's found in Revelation 12. Now, let me just say this, maybe beforehand. Elijah and the church of Revelation 12 have an identical experience. You know what I'm saying? We've been reading our devotion. We are studying the life of Elijah now. Elijah's experience is identical to the church of Revelation chapter 12. Maybe I'll explain it as we continue. Maybe, let me not explain it now. I'll just share with you some of what we've been discovering in our devotions. But let's continue. Now, I want to ask a question. This church in Revelation 12 verses 1, is this the Old Testament church or the New Testament church? Now, I'm going to say, obviously, as we keep reading it, it actually incorporates both. But I'm saying now the picture that we see, let's read verse 2 and I ask the question. It says, verse 2, talking about this church, and she being a child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Verse 2, is this the Old or the New Testament church? Verse 2. Specifically, now, where are we? Verse one is just okay. Let me say okay. Okay, let me say this. Verse one is an overview of the church. Over this is just telling me identification marks. Then verse two now specifically takes me, specifically takes me and says, "Boom! It's gonna start here from this point, and then we trace ourselves all the way right through to the end." So verse two says, "And she, that's the church, the woman." which we studied, we gave text, we showed a woman as a church, specifically in Bible prophecy. Now, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but in Revelation chapter 1, because someone might say, then why are we not reading everything literal? Why, is not, why are we taking, why are we, we, we giving, we are saying that a sun represents this, a moon represents this, a star represents this, the woman, why are we not just taking everything literal? Because that's not the book of Revelation. Actually, the very beginning of the book of Revelation says that God gave this, this, this truth, this revelation truth to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his angel. There's an order in which truth comes. It comes from the Father to the Son. Not like the Son gets truth second hand. The, the Father and the Son are in unity. But the, there's just an order in which things work in heaven. Actually, we are told in volume 6, 200, he orders heaven's first law. Order is heaven's first law. Imagine that God's first law in heaven is order. That's how he operates as order. So the truth comes based on Revelations 1, 1 and 1, 2. It comes from the Father. It's called the revelation of Jesus. He gives it to the Son, Jesus. Jesus gives it to the angel. It says that the angel, what is the word? It says that the angel signified it. Signified, that's the word. Signified it unto John. So it's the Father, Jesus. Now what I'm going to say is this. I know if you read that, you almost think from Jesus to the angel. But that, that is, don't, if you just read verse 1 and 2, you think it's from Jesus to the angel. But that's not true. As you keep reading Revelation, you see it's not from Jesus to the angel. It's from Jesus to the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit to the angel. And then from the angel to John. Now, if someone says prove that, let, let, me, just give, let me just give a text to show that it's the Father, the Son, the Spirit, and then the angel. Actually, let me ask you this. If you read verse 1, can somebody tell me how did John, how did John get, get this truth? From the angel. From the angel, right? We see that it's from the angel. 
Now I want you to jump down in verse 4. Take note, what does John say? Specifically, who does he identify as the one who has given him these messages? He's going to identify God, but he's also going to identify someone else. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace and grace be unto you and peace. Now, take note, from where is he getting these messages which, is going to, which God says he must give to the churches? From where, John, are you getting these messages from for the churches in Asia and for us, obviously? It says from, take note where he's getting these, these messages from. From him which is, which was, and which is to come, referring to God. And it says, and... So it's, the messages are not just coming from God and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And then it says, and, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. Tell me what the three persons in verse 4 and 5, John says, are the source of these messages. Can somebody tell me those three persons? He mentions them there in verse 4. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So you can see that even though verse 1 doesn't identify the Spirit as that the truth is coming from the Spirit, in verse 4, John makes it clear that this message I'm sending, this revelation to the seven churches are coming from the Spirit. So how do we understand this? It comes from God. It comes actually, God gives it to the Son. The Son gives it to the Spirit. The Spirit imparts it to the angel. And then the angel gives it to John. But let me ask you this. From the Father to the angel, is there any, is there any, is there any, are they doing anything to the message or it's going directly from the Father, Son, Spirit and an angel? Are they doing anything to the message? They are doing nothing to the message. Do you know where there's a, what can I say, a packaging, so to speak, of the message? It's only when the angel takes it and now the angel gives it to John. It's now that the message, so to speak, has been packaged. And how, what do you mean package? It says in verse 1. Did I say verse 1? Ah, verse 1. It says, He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, the word signified, when you look up the word signified, all it means is symbolism. So the angel took the direct message from the Father, Son, and Spirit, and he started placing symbolisms on it. Now, let me help you understand something. You know, when you understand the symbolism, then you can understand the message. I'm saying you need to understand the symbolisms to understand the message. God sent, the angel actually signified that that means he placed symbols. So if I understand the symbol, it's easy for me to understand the message. Let me just, let me illustrate what I mean. If you say, how are you doing today? You ask me a question, how, how are you doing today? And I go like this. This is a symbol. What does that mean? Am I doing good or I'm doing yeah, bad? No. I'm doing bad. So can you see, because you knew the symbol, you, un you, you understand what I'm saying. You ask me, okay, would you like me, would you like, um, would you like me to make you um, some, healthy, but, uh, some healthy drink? And I say, what does that mean? I don't know if you can see my hand. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So can you see, because you understand the symbol, you understand what I'm trying to communicate to you. So what happens is the book of Revelation is packed with symbolisms. So all we need to do is go to other parts of the Bible to understand what are these symbols. Because all we are told all books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. All books of the Bible. So some people, you know what they do? I want to know what's the future. And they go straight to the book of Revelation. And they read and they close the Bible. And they become discouraged. I can't understand anything. You know why? They have not previously read other parts of the Bible. Because all books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. That means that in order to understand Revelation, it, borrow, it borrows language from every part of the Bible. And there's no way you can understand it unless you read other parts of the Bible. Now, let us go back to Revelation 12. So that's why we put in a whole lot. We, we try to understand the symbols because these are symbols, not literal. Now, let's go back to Revelation 12. So this is my question in verse 2. Now we specifically identify in verse 2. Is this the Old or the New Testament church? Now, think before you answer. It says that she, being with child, 
She, it says she being a child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Old or New Testament? Are we looking at in verse 2? Old. I'm going to have to suggest it's old. You say, why do I say it's old? Because when we see the church, Jesus is not yet born. And even still, when he is born, the New Testament church is not yet founded. This is the Old Testament church. This is the Old Testament church. Jesus was born into the Old Testament church. It was only after he died, the New Testament church was established. So what I am seeing in verse 2 is the Old Testament church. The Old Testament church. Now let's keep reading. It says in verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and that cast them to the earth. So we have covered this. I'm not going to explain. We know who's the dragon. We know what's the tail. We know what is the third part of the stars in which his tail drew. We, we've covered this before. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to explain it now. It says, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, can somebody tell me who's the dragon based on Revelation 7 verse 9? Sorry, 12 verse 9. I'm so sorry. 12 verse 9. Who is the dragon, that great dragon? It's Satan. So it says that the woman was about to give birth. And the dragon stood before the woman ready to devour the child as soon as the child was born. Now, who is this dragon in the secondary application? I'm going to suggest it's Rome. I'm going to suggest it's pagan Rome. Not papal Rome, but pagan Rome, which we studied the legs of iron. In Daniel chapter 2, we've studied it. I'm going to suggest it's pagan Rome. I believe that the Bible sometimes there's dual applications to the same symbol. Like the dragon represents Satan, but I believe it has a dual application. It represents the power through which Satan worked to try and kill the, 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 the child. Now, question, who did Satan specifically use and under whose rule was that man ruling under? Does anybody know who Satan used in Matthew chapter 2? Let us go there. Let's Herod. Have, it was Herod. It was Herod. Now, question, did the Jews make Herod king or was Herod ruling under the Romans? Who made him king over the Jews? Do you know the Romans? Come with me. Let's go to Matthew 2. He was ruling by decree of the Romans. The Jews had no right to have a king, for them to select a king. The Romans would not allow that. The Romans were ruling the world. They were governing the world. Someone says, how do you know they're governing the world? Read Luke chapter 2. They required a tax of everyone that was born into this world. They taxed everyone. That means you can't tax everyone unless you have power over all. So Rome had power over all. Come with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Let's go to Matthew, the second chapter. I want us to read Matthew 2. Matthew 2. Let us start in Matthew chapter 2. Mm. Um, can someone read for us Matthew 2, verse 1, 2, 3? Matthew 2, verse 1, 2, 3. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Mm, just pause there, just a side note. Question, this is just a side note. These men that actually understand, question, 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 question. Would you agree with me? Okay, let me, let me not ask that. Let me ask this rather, before I ask that. These wise men, let me ask you this. Were these Jewish, uh, were they, did they belong to the Old Testament church? I'm saying were they, were they from, of the Jewish nation or were they outside God's church, his Old Testament church? What would we say? Were they a part, literally, 
Sorry? Out, outside. They were outside. outside. They were not a part of the remnant church, at least then. Then They were not a part. Question, did these people have the scriptures, these wise men? At least, I, I, they never come and say, based on the Bible. Yes. Oh, well, yes. okay. <laughs> Think now, did they come and say, based on the Bible, we know that he is born. They saw his star. The star, so they saw a sign. They were looking at the signs. They were studying the signs. And the signs to them indicated that some great event is about taking place. And they came to the church to tell the church, we don't have scripture, we don't have Bible, but based on what we see, because we are the wise men, we understand the signs. The signs are telling us something's happening. And no scripture, just from what they could see in society, they said something is happening. I wonder if that's going to happen at the end of the world. I wonder if people who don't have Bible, just from what they are studying, whether it's economy, whether any field that they are studying, they're all saying something great and decisive is about to take place. I wonder. But nonetheless, when Herod heard this, it says he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And then verse 4, they basically, Herod gathers all of the, the, the scribes, the Pharisees. He says, tell us based on the Bible now. Verse 4. It says, and when he had gathered all the chief priests, the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. And then obviously they, they start sharing the scripture. So what happens is Herod sends these wise men off. He says that go, go and find him. And um, when you get word, please let me know also that I might also come and worship him. Now let's go and see what happens in verse 13. Verse 13. It says, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Now let's pause there before I go, go, go on. So God saw the heart of Herod, that Herod actually never want to come worship the king, the newborn king. He wanted to kill him. And so he warned the wise men, actually in the previous, previous verse, you would see that in verse 12, not to go back the same way, but go take another route and don't go back to Herod. And then the same angel comes and he warns Joseph and Mary, you'll need to flee because Herod's going to seek to kill the child. Actually, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. And when he arose, he took the young child up and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he diligently inquired of the wise men so here we see Herod makes a dead decree to kill all children now do you do you know based on the bible from the time Herod met the wise men until he makes the decree do you know that two years had transpired like Herod waited for two years from the time those wise men left he waited, he waited, and on the second year, he saw these men are not coming back. These men deceive me. And then he makes a decree to kill all the children. Someone says, how do you know two years? Because if you read verse 16, it says from two years old and under. Why did he kill every child that was two years old and under? Why? According to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So from the time that the wise men told him that they've seen the star until the time he makes the death decree, it was two years. So he makes kill every child two years and under. That's actually the dragon standing before the woman ready to devour the child as soon as the child was born. But obviously God, God saves the child. But Herod was ruling under the Roman power. He was ruling under the Roman power. So what I'm going to suggest that the dragon of Revelation 12, yes, first application of the Satan, but secondary application, it is the nation, the ruling nation, which Satan worked through to actually try and kill the child. And that was the Roman power. Once we pull up this quotation, just to affirm 
what I am saying. But even if we would just keep reading, we would see that. Can I make a short comment on that? Did someone speaking? Yeah, I just asked if I can make a short comment on what you're now saying. Yes. Yeah, um, as you read there, I sit down here and it just came to mind that um, the, I, saw, I saw two decrees there, right? That the one the first coming of the Jesus Christ and also the, the death decree, which is those two decrees is, um, is relevant for in our time as well. Uh, the passing of the national Sunday law and, 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 and the death decree that goes out to the 144,000. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Now, I'm reading from Great Controversy 438. Great Controversy, page 438. It says, the line of prophecy, the line of prophecy in which these symbols are found begins with Revelation 12. With the dragon that sought to destroy Christ at his birth. So now the prophet's specifically dealing with what we are reading. The dragon has said, to be Satan, Revelation 12, verse 9. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. Now take note. But the chief agent of Satan in making war, take note upon Christ and his people during the first century of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, pagan Rome, in which paganism was the prevailing re religion. Thus, whilst the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. So can you see that the prophet is saying exactly what we are saying? We are saying true that the dragon is Satan. But we are saying that in its secondary application it represents Rome. Pagan Rome in which Satan walked through to kill Jesus. So let us go back to Revelation chapter 12. Let's go back to Revelation 12. I want us to now read verse... Hmm. Actually, let's look at quickly before we read verse 5. Um, who is this child that this woman gave birth to? We just saw in Matthew chapter 2, it's representing Jesus. There was a death decree to try and kill him. But I want us to see another verse that specifically identifies Jesus using the word child. There's many, many verses. But let us go to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. There's many verses. We can look at Luke when Gabriel mentions the child that shall be born of thee. But let us go to Isaiah 9 that specifically identifies this child as God. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Isaiah 9 verse 6. It says in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Same child. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Now who is this child? Who is the son? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. In other words, he shall rule. Now who is he? His name, this child's name, shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So, Publicly speaking, that this child that was born is actually God himself. God himself. That's a mystery. But let us go back to Revelation chapter 12. Let's go back to Revelation 12. Verse 5 is just going to emphasize what we've just said, that the child is Jesus. The child is God. The child is the one born of Mary. Let's see now. Revelation 12 verse 5. It says, And she brought forth a man-child. Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now take note who was this child. Yes, we are still doubting. And a child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So what the Bible is saying that this child that was born into the world eventually went up to God and he went and he actually shared the throne of God. Now there's only one person I know is sharing the throne of God that came to this world, born into this world, and today now is sharing the throne of God. Who was that? It's Jesus. Remember Revelation 3? 
Actually, Jesus says that he, do, he that overcometh will like run to sit, sit with me on my throne, even as I have overcame and sat down with the Father on his throne. Revelation 3 verse 21. So Jesus is sharing the throne of the Father. Now, when the Bible refers to the rod of iron, I'm not going there, but you can read Psalms 2 verse 9. You can also read Revelation chapter 19 verse 15. When it refers to this rod of iron, it actually has to do with judgment upon the wicked. Specifically, judgment upon the wicked. This rod of iron. Actually, it says it, they will be dashed into pieces. And he's going to use the rod of iron to dash them into pieces. So, the rod of iron, has to, it's, it's, it's symbolic of his, his right to judge and execute judgment upon the wicked. You will see that in uh, Psalms 2 verse 9, Revelation chapter 19 verse 15. So, let's continue. Let's continue. Mm. Actually, the, the, the death of Jesus actually gave him the right to execute sin. Actually, he didn't need that right. I'm saying God could have just executed sentence upon the wicked all the world. But after his death, like Jesus has the right. He has the right. He has, even before his death, he had the right. But now he has the right more so, so to speak, to execute judgment upon everyone who continues in a life of sin. Now, let us continue. Now, let's read verse 6. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, And the woman, same woman, fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that she should be fed for a thousand, there, she was to be fed there, a thousand two hundred and three score days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days. The woman was to flee into the wilderness for one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Now, what does a day represent in Bible prophecy? Can someone remember a day in prophecy? What is a day in prophecy? A year. A year. That's Ezekiel 4, verse 6, Numbers 14, 34. That a day in Bible prophecy equals a year. So how long will God's church be in the wilderness because of persecution? 1,260 years. So when you are looking for God's true church, you are looking for a church that was persecuted for 1,260 years. And what I'm going to suggest, the one that was persecuting is the false church. The one that was getting persecuted, persecuted was the true church. So when you are looking for God's true church, you have to look for a church that was persecuted for 1,260 years. Now let me ask you this. When, where are we now? I know we were in the Old Testament when the woman had the child. Then, based on verse 5, that the child is now in heaven. So, the woman now can, can no longer be the Old Testament church. The fact that the, the son is in heaven means that his New Testament church is now established. So, we got the Old Testament. We got the New Testament. Now, in verse 6, I'm going to say we are past the New Testament. I'm going to say what, 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 the, what history calls the dark ages. We are now during the dark ages in verse 6. God's church has been persecuted. Where are they? They're in the wilderness. Now I want us to see when the Bible uses this phrase wilderness, it's in connection with almost persecution. When it says that the woman fled into the wilderness, it's almost like telling us that the fact she's in the wilderness is because of persecution. When the Bible uses wilderness, it is in connection with persecution. Let me, let me prove that. Let me prove that. Come with me to Hebrews 11 quickly. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. I want us to read Hebrews 11 verse 33. Actually, Hebrews 11. Actually, let's read verse 35. Actually, it's verse 35. Hebrews 11, verse 35. It says in Hebrews eleven thirty-five, 35, it says, Women received their dead race to life again, and others who were tortured, and others, I want you to see this, others who were tortured. Take note what interesting. Now this is not what I want us to get, but it's interesting what this verse says. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. In other words, they, they didn't want deliverance. Why didn't, even though they were tortured, take note why they didn't want deliverance. 
that they might that they might obtain a better resurrection. So the Bible is saying there were people who were tortured, but they didn't want deliverance from the torturing and eventually leads to death. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. Do you know, Peter says that if we have suffered with Christ, we will reign with Christ. And do you know that Paul says that our light affliction, our light affliction, in other words, our light suffering works for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. In other words, the greater the suffering, the greater the reward. So it says that these people, even though when they were tortured, they didn't want deliverance. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. In other words, a better reward, so to speak. Now, interesting, you know, in Great Controversy, the prophet mentions that the instrument of torture that the papal system used would cause people to be brought to the brink of death. Actually, she says these men were demon-possessed. They would bring them on the point, the brink of death, and they would stop the torture. And then they would re almost recuperate and then boom, bring them again to the, to the brink of death and then stop the torture. She says, until the sufferer hailed death as a sweet release. In other words, they couldn't wait to die. Like, when am I going to die? And you know what inspiration says? By the way, that's Great Controversy 5, 69. That they would be suffered. You know what? Let's see if I can read this quotation very shortly. Great Controversy 5, 69. 569. She says... This is Great Controversy 569. She says, The dignitaries of the church, imagine this, the dignitaries of the church studied under Satan their master. Mm. Imagine studied in connection with Satan. Like you are literally, you are studying how to torture people and Satan is there in the midst teaching you. What, what, I, what I study was that. I, sure. The dignitaries of the church studied under Satan their master. To invent means, what were they studying? To invent means to cause the greatest possible torture and not end the life of the victim. So what were they trying to create? They were trying to come up with things that can cause the greatest suffering, greatest suffer, suffering but without ending the life of the victim. That is evil. In many cases, the infernal process was repeated to the utmost limit of human endurance until nature, that's the human body, until nature gave up the struggle and the sufferer healed death as a sweet release. So inspiration is saying, Satan and the dignitaries of the church study together to make up or invent stuff that's going to cause the greatest possible suffering and don't end the life of the victim. Now someone says, oh, I thank God that that was in the dark ages or that was in the past. Do you know if you read the same book, page 573, Inspiration says, those same weapons are not... Do you know the people who never throw those weapons away when they lost their power? Some people thought they threw it away, they buried it, they said, we're not ever using these things again. Oh no, Inspiration says in 573, they have every one of those weapons. And she says they are messing up even more because there are more people on the earth. And she says she's preparing to use them. So all these weapons that the papacy has, which they invented under Satan, they still have it today. That's Great Controversy 573, which the prophet says they're going to use it. They're going to use it. So all that persecution is going to be rekindled. But we don't need to fear if we are faithful. We have nothing to fear. Let's keep reading. Verse 36 of Hebrews 11. It says, And others had trial." Mocking, scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder. Do you know that, I don't know, do you know that Isaiah the prophet, actually if you, many scholars, not only Adventist scholars, many scholars all over the world, they believe, in every denomination, they believe when, when, you, when you talk about the gospel prophets, do you know which prophet they identify as the gospel prophet? I mean the prophet that wrote most about the gospel in the Old Testament. There's one prophet that wrote most about Jesus. Do you know which prophet it was? Isaiah. Isaiah. He, 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 he was the prophet that wrote most. Actually, 
There's not a prophet in the Old Testament that writes more than Isaiah on, on Jesus. Isaiah 53, the death of Jesus. Everything you'll find it in the book of Isaiah. Do you know how he died? Does anybody know how Isaiah died? He was so asunder. Do you know how, how, what inspiration says? If you go to, a, if you grab this Bible and you go to the commentary of Isaiah chapter one and you read it there, she says that he was cut in off. They sawed him in. Literally, they cut him in off. They sawed him in off because of the gospel. He was, he was uplifting Jesus, uplifting Jesus, and they, they killed him. Let's keep reading. It says, and others, verse thirty-seven. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. From verse 35 to 37, is that a good picture? I'm saying, is this a good picture? Is this persecution? This is persecution. And then I want you to see, that's the description of persecution. Take note, where are these people in verse 38? Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered, take note, where were they during this persecution? Where were they fleeing to? In connection with, they wandered in deserts and in mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. So can you see, whenever God's people are in dens, they're in caves, they're in the wilderness, it's always because of persecution. Always because of persecution. So when the Bible says that the woman fled into the wilderness, Basically, it means that there was persecution upon the church and therefore the church had to flee. Okay, friends, I'm looking at the time and I'm seeing, maybe we, I don't know if we have 10 minutes left. We're not going to finish, but maybe we can finish verse 6. We're not going to finish, but maybe we can finish verse 6. So I'm coming back to verse 6. Um, what I want us to do, um, can we read also, because verse 6 is clearly connected to verse 14. Verse 14 is actually saying the same thing as verse 6. We'll stop, we'll stop on this point. Verse 14 is saying the same thing as verse 6. Um, I want us to read verse 14. Let's read verse 14. Now, it's saying the same thing but in a different way. It says, and the woman, sorry, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into a place where she has nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, I'm saying what we see in verse 14 is helping us understand when we do get to Daniel chapter 7, what is a time, times, and a half a time? Same woman fled into the wilderness, but now it doesn't say 1,260 years. It says a time, times, and a half a time. So then how would we understand a time, times, and a half a time if you're going to compare it to verse 6, which uses the same language, a woman, a woman, wilderness, wilderness, only when it comes to the time. Instead of saying 1,260 years, it says time, times, and a half a time. Would you agree that a time, times, and a half a time, if you're going to compare it with 6, verse 6, represents 1,260 years? Yes. Amen. So it says that she went into the wilderness. So, and it says in verse 14, she was nourished. So God, even though she was in the wilderness, it says that she was nourished of God. Now my question is, what is this nourishment? Because it says that even though she was in the wilderness being persecuted, what is the nourishment? What is this nourishment? Come in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let us see what is this nourishment. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Take note. Nourished. That's that same word that God nourished them in the wilderness. Nourished up in the... Take note what God nourishes people up in. Nourished up in the words of faith and of the good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. 
So when it says that God nourished the church in the wilderness, what does that mean? He gave them good doctrine. Their faith was strong. So even though the church was out in the wilderness, they never have a place to worship. They were just worshiping in caves and dens. The Bible says they were nourished. That means God gave them good doctrine. They had good doctrine. They were being persecuted. They had good doctrine. Now, I'm going to conclude here. And then we, we, if there's those who want to remain in Ox, what we have studied, anything, they need clarity, we would remain. Now, let's conclude here. Can somebody tell me, maybe not now, I shouldn't ask the question now, but maybe let's just ask it. In verse 14, it says, who was the woman fleeing from? I'm asking in verse 14, it specifically identifies. Verse 6 doesn't so much say, but verse 14 specifically identifies who was she fleeing from. Does anybody know who was she fleeing from? Verse 14 says who? The serpent. The serpent. The serpent. The serpent. The serpent. Now tell me, who is the serpent based on verse 9? Who is that great, that old serpent? <laughs> Satan. But Thank now, you. now friends, remember, sometimes prophecy has a dual application. So who would the serpent represent in verse 14? Those who have already studied, studied the 1,260 years, who would the serpent represent in verse 14? In other words, who did Satan walk through in verse 14, during the 1,260 years, to persecute the church. The, amen. Amen. So, the first application of the serpent would be Satan, but the secondary application would be Papal Rome. Would be Papal Rome. So, I'm going to stop here because of the time, because some people we know have to leave, and then we, we, will, we will conclude the study in our next study. And then, those who want to remain and ask questions, we would remain a few minutes. I want to just read a quotation concerning the wilderness. Uh, I want to read this and then we pray. Um, I want to read this quotation on the wilderness. Okay. Okay, I'm reading from Great Controversy, page 54. The prophet says, and now, obviously, there's a description of what happened, and then the prophet says, And now began the 1,260 years of papal oppression, foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. Those are the verses. Christians were forced to choose either to yield integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and worship, or to wear away their lives in dungeons, or suffer death by the rack, the faggots, or the herdsman's axe. Now were fulfilled the words of Jesus, ye shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for not my name's sake. Then the prophet says, persecution opened upon the faithful with greater fury than ever before, and the world became a vast battlefield. For hundreds of years, 1,260 years, for hundreds of years, the Church of Christ found refuge in seclusion and obscurity. What is this seclusion and obscurity? Then she's going to explain. She's giving a Bible verse to explain the church being in seclusion and obscurity. Thus says the prophet, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her 1,203 score days. So what the prophet is saying here, what led the woman to flee into the wilderness was persecution. But then she explains in the blue words, what is the wilderness? The seclusion, it is obscurity. The church was in seclusion, meaning they had to flee. <coughs> they had to flee. So I'm going to stop right here, and then I'm going to pray. And then we will resume our study when we come back. We will resume our study and we will conclude. Hmm. Yeah, we will conclude God's church. So I'm going to pray now and then if there's any clarity, we'll do that. Let us pray. Let us pray.
Loving Father, we, we are truly thankful for the time you could have spent looking at your word. Thank you so much for the book of Revelation. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity we have received thus far concerning the experience of the true church. And Father, if we just look, much of this has been history. If we would just look and search, the identification marks are clear concerning your remnant church. Thank you so much for this wonderful chapter. Thank you so much for the book of Revelation. And Father, I just pray that as we continue to study specifically this lesson, that our faith will be established that indeed the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's remnant church of Bible prophecy. Thank you so much, Lord, for the clarity of your word. Thank you for teaching us. We really love you, Lord, and may every one of us determine by your grace, if not yet, to be a part of this remnant church. And those of us who are, may we recommit ourselves to you and may we be faithful to the truth you have committed to this church. That when the storm breaks upon this final remnant people of yours, Lord, we would not forsake this body of believers, but we would stand true to you. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing this prayer. Keep us all safe. Thank you so much for also allowing us to resume the study. And we just pray, Father, that you'll keep back the powers of darkness as we continue to study these wonderful truths. We love you for that and we pray these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing But all oh, the joy when I shall wake Within the palace of the King And I shall see him face to face